Welcome to Just an Average Citizen, the podcast that helps to inform, educate, and empower you to make an impact in Abilene and the big country. I'm so excited you joined me today. This is another great week, and I, I promise I'm not going to say it if it's not. There's going to be some slow weeks, like next week with Thanksgiving. There's There are a couple of meetings, but it's not going to be super as engaging, I'm sure, with the, the amount of information. Who knows? I say that every time, and I am actually proven wrong. So let's see what happens. I was really excited to get started to uh, prepare for this podcast. We had a really full week. I think there were five meetings Uh between council meetings and board meetings this week. And so there was a lot going on. And one of the things I was doing as I was preparing is I found out that we might be having a positive impact. And so I can't guarantee that it is the reason that we are the reason. But I will say some things changed within the last week of what we were talking about. If you listen to the podcast last week, we talked about boards and commissions and how hard it is to follow and track and and see what's going on, especially when the most current um, information on the website is from June of 2023. And knowing that it was updated in May, and then I never saw anything happen. And so when I went to go try and figure out where the vacancies are, it's really hard to follow. And so when I went to look at the website and clicked on the documents, look what we have. It's as of November 6, 2023. How exciting is that? From the time the podcast was dropped on Monday of last week to the time we are recording for this week's podcast, it has been updated. And as you can see, it is including we have one vacancy on the Animal Services Board. We have two on the Board of Adjustments, two on the Board of Building Standards. We have one on the Civil Service Commission, which is a really small board. So that is a big, impactful spot. We have two vacancies on Keep Babbling Beautiful, which we already knew about. Two vacancies on Landmark Commission, which, wow, that would be really cool. One vacancy on the library advisory board, which we found out last week because they didn't appoint one member like they had originally planned. And I think, oh, and here's two vacancies on the visual arts jury board. Do you think they'll let me be a part of that one? That would be an exciting one to be a part of, especially with all the ways I've participated in changing so much of what happens on the visual jury arts board. That's really fun. So I just wanted to let you know that it is really encouraging, not that people tell you that you're making a difference, but when you see things start to change, things that you're pointing out, that really gets a little pick up in my step and makes me want to keep going at it. And Some days it doesn't always feel that awesome. And that's why I'm doing this podcast because I want people to know that we can make a difference together. We're not alone. There's more of us out there than we realize. And odds are is we're just not in the same circle groups or interacting all the same at the same time in the same ways. And that's why another reason why I have this podcast is because I want you to know there are lots of people wanting to be involved. They just don't know how to go about it. And I'll let you know, a year ago, this was never on my radar. I had no, I wanted to help people get on city council. I thought that would be fun, not really doing that part, but making a difference and changing how our government is run by bringing new people. And I thought that would be really encouraging, but I had no desire to learn budgets or boards or any of this stuff. So I'm just letting you know that if you stick around long enough, I think you're going to find that it is quite an interesting drama filled engagement that we are getting to be a part of. And I don't even need to watch TV anymore because of all that I'm seeing going on. And so it's it's really interesting. And, and I think you'll hear more about that when we talk about the weekend review. But I just wanted to let you know we're making a difference. And thanks to you. And thanks to you being willing to subscribe and share and let people know about this podcast. I think we'll continue making headways in a positive way. And so that that brings me up to my next point is if you are on next door, what a great way to share this podcast with people because it can help really unify us and bring us together about being more informed and engaged and, and educated on what's going on so we can make an impact in our city and county. The thing is, or the big country, I guess rather, the thing is, is most of these board positions have to have a citizen. You have to be a citizen of Abilene to be on it. There's one or two maybe that you can be a county resident. But even if you don't want to be on the board, I understand. I think there's probably 27 boards. 
you know, and we give an average of 10 people on a board, that's like less than 300 people. So clearly out of, you know, 85,000 registered voters in our city, we're not going to need all of us to be on a board. But one thing you can do is pick a board, show up and make sure you just are present, even for just a, um, a quarter, like for three months, a lot of these boards meet once a quarter. So that's not too much of a commitment. And I'll just let you know, I've made it easy for you. I've been showing up to board meetings all by myself. I have some friends who've been doing that as well. And it's really, it's it's fun when you start to get them used to having people present. And I know there are a lot more people present that we can see on the videos if they're recorded. And I know there's different seasons where more people are involved. But if we can get to be a regular part of just that experience and just being engaged in that way, that is a game changer. And so find one board, whether it's in animal services or if you love the historic aspect of a Landmarks Commission or you want to know those standards they use to really help keep people in a healthy perspective or just keeping our our city in some kind of controlled, um, organized manner where it's not just everything's willy nilly. Or it could be that you um, love library books. There are so many great things you can be a part of. I will say there are so many that I'm really interested in that I, I can't go to all of them all the time. And there are some that I don't really have to go, but I'm going to go to check them out. So join me. I'll be at most of the board meetings so you can help me not be the only person <laughs> from time to time or show up when I'm not there. And that way we can just continue to have great conversations. So one of the disappointing parts of this update, which I'm really excited it's updated, I can't help celebrate, is that there's this other listing that has, and I'm not going to zoom in because it's just all the names of all the different people on the boards. They're physical board member names. And the lists don't match up. And you know, I know this is a lot of paperwork and I am a I am not a stickler to details when it comes to stuff like this. And that's why I'm not ever probably going to be a secretary of any kind because you don't want me in that position. But I will say that it just is helpful if there's a vacancy on one paper, maybe you either have the vacancy consistent on how you handle it because there are some boards that don't show all the vacancies and there are some boards that show a vacancy, but it doesn't show that there's a vacancy on the other paper. Does that make sense? It's it's not congruent. So if we could just get those lined up so that... A, we could look at one and go, oh, look, these are all filled and I'll have to peruse through all these copious amounts of details to know where we can jump in. So I hope that's encouraging to you. I hope that you can see, I, I will zoom in for this. Looky here. It says, you remember last time, November 6, it's zoomed. Now it's zoomed. I hope you can see it. Maybe. I don't know. I can't remember how big this is on our screens because I know it's it's different from my view when I record to when you actually see it. But look, it's updated as of November 6, 2023. I'm pretty stoked about that. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to some updates. I saw these things just trying to, I because I'm doing this podcast, I have a, a Facebook page that allows me to follow different organizations that are strictly about the city. And I really like it. It's, it's like a it's almost like a news feed for me on what's going on local. And so I found a couple of things I wanted to share with you I thought would be interesting that the Chamber of Commerce has welcomed new members in October. So here are all the different people that are all the businesses that have joined the Chamber of Commerce. Now, I'm still trying to figure out what the Chamber of Commerce is because I know it does a lot of great things for our community and there's a lot of different branches of it or um, different, uh, you know, like the Abilene Visitors Convention or the Abilene Cultural Affairs Council, and um, there's another uh, growing Abilene Growing Alliance Growth or something. I just learned of a new one. There's lots of different components to it, and I'm not sure all the places it reach in, which I'm hoping to learn more about. So we have Bogadesh, which I think is a new restaurant, um, a sandwich shop downtown, Coastal Cookies, the Dive Spot, Helping Hands, KACU, Kiwanis Club. I'm not reading all of these, but I just wanted to read a few of these. Um, Adventure Cove, which that's no longer a city owned property. So that's interesting and fun. I didn't even look at this list, but I just saw that they have these are all the members who are part of the Chamber of Commerce. And because of their partnership, there are some benefits and perks that our city receives because they can work together to help promote what's going on in Abilene. Now, I saw this and I thought, you know, what, who knows who's listening out there? You can work as an environmental health manager 
in this the public health department and it looks like your annual sa annual salary is 72,000 to 90,000 so I don't even know what the, the the requirements are but that seems like a pretty decent paying job so if that's you and you're looking for work there you go but you know it's good to know what kind of things are going on and what job openings are available within things uh, different aspects of our city and then I really uh, I just I found this um, on a Facebook page. I'm trying to remember exactly where I found this, but it was available to the public. And this is the 137th anniversary of Mount Zion Baptist Church. And I thought, what a historical celebration that there is a church that has been celebrating and worshiping Jesus for 137 years. That is something to be commended for. And it seems like they had a Western attire theme for the event. So that looks like it was a lot of fun, and I'm glad to see these things. I hope I can get ahead of the ball so I can, you know, prepare to go to some of these events. I'm not a typical huge social person. Like, I don't really like all the the, the bells and whistles of the big party and galas and stuff like that, but who knows? Maybe I didn't think I was going to study city government, so look where I'm at now, so who knows what's coming up. And I think the last thing, again, here's just another thing I just thought was interesting learning the history about our city, that Community Foundation of Abilene, the annual celebration of local philanthropy was created in 1989 by former President George H.W. Bush from November 12th through 18th. Join us in recognizing the impact of the community foundations across the country. So I had no idea. I really thought Community Foundations of Abilene was a local thing. I didn't even know that George H.W. Bush was the one that introduced that in 1989. And one of the things I learned is they do biannual grants. I think that's how you say it. There's a grant that they do in the spring and a grant that they do in the fall that helps different organizations um, as they're able to distribute the money. So this is um, quite a bit of, of fiscal impact in a lot of different organizations in town. All right, so now with all those exciting announcements made, we're going to move on to the week in review. All right, so the week in review was full and busy. I actually traveled out of town two days this week, and so I was really shocked I was able to go to as many meetings as I was able to. I missed one because I told you last week it was rescheduled from a Monday to a Wednesday, which was weird. And I still haven't found out how to communicate to chairman on boards, but I'm working on that and I'm trying to figure it out. And as I learn things, I'll let you know. One of the things I have found is that there is a direct path for us to ask simple questions. And so in preparation for stuff, if there's a question I have, I have found there are there are key people that we can talk to you about learning to want to know information. For example, there's a meeting on Monday I'm going to go to, and I'm just going to reach out and see if they actually have something available beforehand so that if I'm there, they might be able to have it for me rather than just waiting and showing up. But there's got to be a line of communication, and I hope that you can learn how to just make that a part of the natural process of being a citizen in our community. So like I said earlier, there were five meetings this week. Let's move to the first meeting of the week, which was the Board of Adjustments meeting. I really wasn't expecting much on this meeting. It was one item on the regular agenda and I thought it was going to go very quickly. One thing I'll note from now on is there were no minutes posted from this meeting, the prior meeting on in August. And so it's hard to stay in touch with some of the things that are going on. I know the minutes are bare bones and they're more for legal re uh, records. But what I have found in going to multiple board meetings is everyone has minutes. And so for them not to make it available to the public doesn't make sense, especially if it's in an open meeting. And because of the Open Meetings Act, we have access to this information. We shouldn't have to open record search for minutes just because someone didn't post it. Uh, give the minutes to the secretary to post to the website. And so always try and find it on the website first if you're looking for something and just do your best to search it out before you ask them. Because, you know, if they've already done the work of putting it out for us, then we should take advantage of it. But this was not the case for this meeting. So let's go over to this slide here. Um, the first meeting that um, or the first item on the agenda is this particular house. Um, this gentleman was wanting to put a carport on his house. And I have really been impressed with how they handle things. I've, I've never seen any reason to be confused 
at some of the process, but I will just say this one was a little bit more confusing to me as a, a private citizen watching what was going on. And again, I hope I can make the meeting, um, but these fall at a time where I do have something scheduled every time. And so it's hard to, to make these meetings. So I'm not present to ask questions. Of course, I don't recall them doing public comments at this meeting because maybe no one was there except for the particular gentleman who owned the property. But they did swear people in. They, this is a meeting they do swear in so that you have to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help you God. But so he wanted to put a carport. And let me see if I can zoom in. He wanted to put a carport next to his house right here. And I can't, uh, this little red box, if you're looking at the screen or if you're watching this, you can see there's a red box. What happened was, is he built his house in 2004 and they put out a concrete pad for their kids to play basketball with. And so now that their kids are grown, they'd really like a carport after the hailstorms we had last summer. And so this carport is fine as it is. However, I mean, this concrete pad, is that what I said? The concrete pad is fine as it is. However, if he were to put a carport on it, it would encroach that space that you're supposed to have your property set back from the, the right of way or whatever this area is out on the corner. I can't think of the name right now, but it would also extend, I believe, over three feet. And so he was here before this particular board to ask if he could put a carport next to his house. The other caveat is most of the time carports are supposed to be attached to a house. And one of the things I realized afterwards is he explained beyond reasonable doubt. I mean, there's no doubt he was going to make sure. I don't know why they have to be attached to house. I, the only thing I can think of is to make sure they're secure or maybe to present, prevent the distance factor take, being an issue. If it's next to the house, it's not going to be out like this one would be. And so he had a plan to really secure it in concrete. And, and it sounded like he had really thought it through. And he really approached with a lot of consideration for all the reasons why he needed this exception made. And what the gentleman started on the board saying is, ah, we don't like this. We don't, this is an exception. Why can't you have it on the house? Why can't you attach it to the fence? Why can't you do it? I mean, it was, it felt like, and again, this is just my perception because I don't, I wasn't there. I didn't get to follow up and ask conversations, but it felt like they didn't want a carport. It was not going to happen. And, and that was discouraging to me as a person watching because it's like, ah, I can understand if there's a reason, but it sounded like there was a no coming. And instead of just saying no, we wasted a lot of time talking about all the reasons why it didn't matter. And even the lawyer had to uh, interject and say, listen, that's not what we're trying to decide here. Just stay at this one point. Do you approve for him to put a carport? And if that's the case, he has to go to another board and get them to approve the easement. That's what it's called, the easement. And so um, I share all that and I got to move on quickly because we got a lot to talk about. To me, this is what we have missed and failed to do as citizens. One of the board members said, hey, I just, I don't really like doing this because it's going to set precedents that other people can do this or precedent that other people can do this. And I don't want to set precedent. And that's where I wanted to say, whoa, I wish I could have been there and said, listen, it's not the board's job to set precedent. Their job is not about precedent. Their job is to deal with an exception because someone wants something made to be the exception. It's not the norm. It won't be guaranteed to be the norm going forward. And it's not fair to this gentleman who has, in my opinion, from what I can tell, a legitimate issue. The reason why I'm saying this is most houses, like you can see this one, it has a limited amount on the front and then most of the backyard is enclosed. So there's a lot more flexibility on a typical structure or there's not as much flexibility for a carport. However, this gentleman's house, you can see here's the road. Here's the front of the house right here, if you're looking on the screen, and here's his driveway on the side of the house. So in some ways, this is in his backyard. And so it's not even like it's in the front of the house. So if this house had wanted a carport, you know, there's it's really going to change how things look. And, and that makes more sense. But this is kind of a unique situation. And it was really disappointing to me to see the board, A, feel like they are choosing the rest of the decisions from here on into in, in, into eternity, the decision here will affect everything go forward. And that's that's not what the board is for. He's supposed to deal with this individual, this individual gentleman's exception to what's going on. And so a lot of times we've gotten into this, well, we don't want to set precedence. That's my point is precedence is not about 
the, it's not the burden of the people coming to this board. It's not the burden of people coming to court for the judge to say, well, whatever decision I make is going to change the rest of history. No, it's not your job. Your job is to deal with this, the, the circumstances in, in this situation. And I just, I felt bad for this gentleman because, um, it could have gone much differently. And who knows what the next one, they could have said, no, you can't have the easement, which he would have had to adjust. And he said he was willing to adjust. And, and so it was just to me disappointing to see that people are, are stepping out beyond where they're supposed to be. Actually, um, they're stepping out beyond what they're supposed to be doing. It's just really discouraging to see people who are not staying in the boundaries of what they're chosen, they're supposed to do. And I've seen boards handle that better. And I feel like this was a lost, a lost opportunity here to deal with this one differently. And there, there wasn't a strong position from what was made and just the viewing of this, this interaction. Okay. So the next one I want to go to is the public health meeting. I am as about as squeamish as they come. So it's really fun to go to this meeting because, you know, <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to go into. Although I did see the agenda and it was really interesting. I know that they had presented a new medical director for the public health position or the public health, um, the Taylor County, the Abilene Taylor County Public Health District. And before... He was approved at the county level and he was about to be presented before the council and for some reason he withdrew his application. So I thought, you know, I would love to be in on that conversation and see how they come about choosing and what they talk about when they get to that place. So I didn't know if they had someone else lined up or what. So I thought it actually worked out for me to go and I showed up and um, it was interesting. I'm sad that they don't videotape this one because I think it would be very helpful for people to be able to watch and see what's going on in our public arena, the public health arena. Because there's a lot of really good information I feel like the doctors engage with um, on a level that I think it's just good to see insight and hear what, what they're thinking and their experience. So there were several things on the public, on, on the uh, public health, they call it the health advisory board, the public health district board. Um, and I noticed there were no minutes. There are no minutes posted on here. So the agenda back is just the agenda. And I've always wondered about that, but I didn't really feel like I had the knowledge to ask good questions. And now I know they can put minutes on here. The boards are not sharing the minutes with the city secretary for her to post them. So I think that's a good thing to start encouraging boards just to be able to turn in their minutes. I was, I was confused because I didn't know if every board had to have one, but now that I've gone to enough of them, they all are reviewing the minutes. And I don't understand this whole give the minutes to people and say, look over it in one minute and see if you see a problem with it. These minutes should be sent out beforehand so that the people can review it and then show up and say, uh, everything looks great on this. I don't feel like the minutes are really providing much information if you can peruse it in a minute and decide that everything looks good. Plus, I've asked for minutes to be corrected when names were miswritten in minutes. And I was told, eh, it's not that big of a deal. It doesn't change anything. And I'm just thinking, you know, a standard of excellence is a good place to operate from. So maybe we should write down names correctly as best as we can, especially if we know they're wrong. We should, especially if we record people's positions that are not what they said. Um, I think that's important, too, because if you said, hey, I'm against this and the minutes reflect that you are for it, I'm sure that person probably is not too excited. They don't even probably know that they had their record, their uh, position recorded incorrectly. OK, so on the public health one, like I said, there were no minutes. I think uh, like they're looking for a new health director. It is uh, sounds like a position for more of a retired physician. It needs to be one that's in the public life who can deal with media and stuff like that. And so until they can find someone, Dr. Rob Wiley at Hendrick has said he will help oversee that because of the Mercy Clinic and the what they do in the Mercy Clinic, they have to have a doctor who oversees or that they can consult if they have any questions. And so it sounds like it's a temporary fix, but it is not probably going to be, I'm not sure how they're going to fill it. It's, I don't know how they're going to fill it. So they're looking for people right now to fill it. Um, the next thing they had that they talked about on their board, there's, and, and again, I'm trying to hit the highlights, but there was so much I thought was really worth talking about the new surveillance project, wastewater and opioid overdoses. And so Olivia, oh my gosh, I can't read her name right from up here. I wrote her name down in another place. 
Uh, Dabbert, Olivia Dabbert, she's cute. She was a real, she was very knowledgeable and wise beyond in areas I have no knowledge of. And she made it very enjoyable to listen to her. Let me see if I have these in the right order. Nope. Okay. So they handed out these papers and do you like my fancy picture work? Uh, I've asked, I've requested for if they present stuff in meetings to share those presentations with us, like there were an entire program and I would have taken a picture of what was on the screen, but the gentleman presenting it and Olivia presenting, I'll talk about maybe him later, but they were standing literally in front of the screen. So I couldn't. So I did think this is interesting. So the CDC is giving grants. I'm not sure if it's to just county cities or what, but they're giving, they're giving money for people to do surveillance on our wastewater. So basically what that means is everything that goes out our sewers, they're going to test to see what we're doing. For example, they're going to be testing for 12 pathogens, SARS-CoV-2, RSV, A and B, influenza, uh, the norovirus, West Nile, Zika, monkeypox, polio and measles. And they're going to be testing to see about opioids and I know it's great to have knowledge and information above hand, and I really am trying to present information to you in a non-editorial way, but I just want to ask the question, what is, what are you giving up when you allow people to surveil you? If you give them permission to do more, gather more information and data on you, what are you giving up? Is it worth the cost? Is it worth having um, if we should have another virus breakout, is it good to be able to tell people they're quarantined at home? Is that something you enjoyed? Or is it something you think, yeah, at all costs, we should, you know, lock everybody up who might potentially be at a risk. We always have to give up freedom if we give the government more ability to monitor what we're doing. And I think this is something to pay attention to. The thing is, is it's paid for. So all they do is gather the water, send it up, they test it and send it back. And so I think the intent is really to do something good with it. But we know government is not always got a morality system. And so it really doesn't have any gauge to when it's gone too far or when it's not gone too far. And so we just have to be very careful in considering what freedoms are we sacrificing in order to allow them to have more information about us without really us knowing when they're doing it and how they're doing it. And, and I think that's really important to have a conversation about. So talk amongst yourselves and see what you think. Um, the other thing is the dialogue between the doctors was so fascinating in this meeting. They were like, actually, opioids, we don't really prescribe them anymore. It's really fentanyl. And if you're getting an opioid crisis or you're seeing a tick in it, it's because it's on the black market or from the drug cartels. And it's like, whoa, that kind of changes everything on its head. And it's just knowing what the information means and having their input is helpful. And I really appreciated all the conversations they were having in and their desire to educate people. They were really concerned that there would be doctors prescribing opioids when what they informed us of who were in the meeting that there's a better path, there's a better option of how to treat and help with pain management. And so I think that was a great conversation. They, oh, that was the other thing. They don't have any database to help figure out what's going on. So like 80% of those overdose, they have no really known reason in the hospital because it costs too much to really test what they overdosed on. And sometimes, or that actually includes children. And so children are getting this stuff all the time. It's not the same information as adults who overdose or why they're overdosing. And so just basic information that they're wanting to keep better track of. And again, I understand why they're doing it. I have no issue with why they're doing it. I just think as citizens, we have to start being more aware when we give permission for people to surveil us and take our information, keep track of it, it comes at a cost. And at what point will that cost come back and bite us in the rear? Or it's just always going to stay in a positive way. We just don't know. And we've seen that happen recently enough that we have to be careful that we don't allow boundaries to be crossed on when people are allowed to be present and in the public and when people have to stay in their homes and all those things. So we just have some real recent history that should give us pause and that our federal government is so interested in paying for this also should give us pause because I believe we're running out of money. And so for all this research, it seems like something's got to give. But I think that's a prevailing theme we have that money grows on trees and we really don't have to pay attention to what we spend because we'll just get it, get more.
Um, okay. And then the last thing that I thought was interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. Um, no, that's not the last thing. They have restructured where the Children's Advocacy Center is. It used to be under the police department, and now it's going to be under the health, um, public health department. And this is, I'm not really sure exactly why, because the only way they actually review or check on cases is because there is an open um, investigation for a child or a circumstance. And so Melinda Beard was present and she shared about the flow and the teamwork and all the things. And it, I, I'm, the, the Children's Advocacy Center, it really seems like a beneficial thing, especially to those unfortunate children who have, to have experienced or witnessed a crime and are abused. And she gave a lot of information. The one thing that was weird or interesting that they need to study more is that cases of reporting have gone down. And so now they're sending new benchmarks of things they should be heading to make sure they're getting all these cases. And again, when we know that when we take children out of school, things shift and change. And I'm not sure if we've still recovered from all that time being away from school. Um, new norms have been established and, you know, things have been allowed probably that would have gotten noticed had they not had that lull between kids being present in the school systems, but they have some benchmarks that they're working on to make sure that no kid falls through the cracks. And so they seem really excited to have that under their umbrella of what the health department does. And um, I think that was really good. The The one I don't have a picture for, and I'm going to try and s quietly slide back over to my notes because I took like 10 pages of notes because this is so new to me. Um, and I don't understand all that's going on. So the last thing I wanted to point out to you was the um, vote on vote or um, whether to recommend a new charity care program. And so I didn't realize this, but Abilene has not really ever had a charity care program for the medical services they offer. And so there's a new program that they're able to Kevin. Uh, I think that's who presented it. I can't read his last name, but there's a new care program that they're wanting to present and allow to get some federal dollars or state dollars back from services provided. And so there's people who are on government programs and then there's people who just don't quite make it and they fall between the cracks. And so that's kind of what they're talking about helping supplement. The problem is that if they do this care program, they have to turn in their expenses in November and then they do not know if they'll be reimbursed until March. And so they were calculating the, the pros and cons of this, um, and they were saying, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's $90,000 that we could risk losing if we don't do it, so let's go for it. And they recommend, recommended to tell the council to um, begin doing this program. I thought it was interesting. The chairman said, you know, I don't know anything about this. I'm just going to trust what information has been presented. And again, if there was a meeting packet or if there was something that people could look into before they show up, I don't really think it's fair to make a decision over a five minute conversation where you tell it about the pros and cons and just check off on it. Again, I know that $90,000 isn't a million dollars. It isn't the $52 million they ask for to help do some projects for the bonds. It isn't even the $8 million that they spent on the convention center part of the hotel or any of that stuff. It's not even that much. It's $90,000, but I do think we risk or send up red flags when we look at the money that our taxes go to that they could be considered as riskable, right? And so I, I'm new to this and I, I want to understand this, but these are the questions that I would ask. So why are we risking something if we don't know it's going to happen? Let's Let's maybe start it at 50% and see where we go from there and see about maybe only $45,000 lost. You know, I don't know. Um, I want people to be able to receive their medical services, but I also know that the more medical services you receive through government programs like this, it said one of the cons was there's a lot more tracking that has to go on and a lot more information kept. And the more we track and keep information on people, the less freedom they have to make medical choices they want to. And, and some of these people may not have the education, they know how to make medical choices, but we definitely know that in this day and age, we want to have freedom to be able to say yes to this and no to that. And if you're having to maintain strict tracking or standards to in order to receive services, it could also feel like a little bit of a, you know, you, a, a bait and switch. You got to do it in order to get and 
maybe you wouldn't have gotten it if you didn't have the other stuff. And so I'm not sure. I'm going to look into it. And I hope you look into it too. See, it is going to be on the council's agenda probably next on December 6th, I think it is, the next council meeting. So that's something to look at. Anyway, it was really fascinating. It was only an hour. And like I said, I took 10 pages of notes because there was just so much information that I wanted to understand and be able to remember what things are said so that I don't go back. And I will say, I really was impressed with how much conversation the doctors were willing to have to talk about things going on. And I appreciate that because as someone who is watching and not participating in the conversation, it's good to hear the thought processes and where they're coming from and what they're they're getting at after, after before they make their decision. And so I appreciated that as a citizen, an average citizen watching in an area I probably know very little about in some ways. And I know a lot because of just recent years has helped me to become a more educated and informed consumer of um, medical health. All right, so let's look at the next meeting. The next meeting we're going to go to was the Citizen Advisory uh, Advisory Board for People with Disabilities meeting. All right, I told you. I warned you that there are going to be times when I say the stupidest things. So forgive me. I hope it doesn't cause you to turn away and run away from my my podcast. But I looked at the the meeting and it said it was in the second floor auditorium. And I'm like... There is no second floor auditorium. It's because it was at the main library. I know. I mean, you know, if I just read the whole thing, I trust, trust me, I don't do that as important things, but I just was like, you know, sometimes I say the the, the stupid parts out loud. So it actually was held on location at the main branch of the library. They did not, oh, let me get to the right, the right slide here. Oh, I forgot before I move on to this, I did just look up what's available because, you know, there's no minutes, there's not much. They really don't have much on the website except for COVID cases. And I did forget to mention, sadly, that Dr. Goodnight did pass away recently. He had already retired from being the medical director and you know, they, they observed a moment of silence in honor of him and, 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 and you can tell they, they appreciated his um, impact that he made in Abilene, but this is it. There's 6,000 results. And, you know, there's the list that I've already shown you. There's a COVID test, COVID test, COVID test. So there's really just not much information. And so, like I said, the more we get involved, the more we're going to be able to explain and share what's going on. Okay. So here we are. the Citizens Advisory Board for People with Disabilities Agenda. There's not much here. There's no agenda packet. There's, there are some slides. I forgot. There are some slides on the agenda packet. And I think that's on my next, my next tab that I'll click on to. But they did meet at the library because there was a presentation of the main library and a tour of the main library. And so um, look at that. There we go. I tell you what, sometimes I get things so organized and other times I just don't know what I do. So I I would love to be able to share what they talked about because I think it's very important for me to communicate what's going on so that you can know what's going on. And they updated something about the CityLink update and then they had some kind of proclamation for Disability Awareness Month. And I feel like that's what happened at maybe the first November meeting, city council meeting where Mayor Hurt proclaimed that because I do believe I remember seeing some of these board members there. And so again, this is all the information we have. And then present and fu- present and future our present and future of citizen advisory board for people with disabilities. And so they probably had some discussions about something about that. I don't know really what else to tell you. And I'm just saying that this is why we don't know what's going on, because I don't think they think we want to know. And until we tell them we want to know, then it's not going to change. And then they had the presentation of the a presentation tour of the library. All right, so that's all I have to pro- promote on there. Like I said, there were no minutes for this meeting. There are minutes that they approve, but I, I've watched these because this is normally in the chamber. And so that's probably why I was a little confused, but mainly because I just didn't read the whole information. And that's all for that meeting. All right, so let's go to the Senior Citizen Advisory Board meeting. Again, this is going to be a pretty, pretty quick one. And I would love to be able to share what they are talking about, but as one who can't go, to the meeting. I don't know what's going on. So I just look at the agenda 
And I see that again, they had minutes that they approved, but there are no minutes listed. And I will say most of these, if they haven't listed minutes today, it's not because they have been doing it in the past. There's just nothing available. And I thought that was normal. Now I know it's not. So I'm hoping we can get that changed and updated to make an impact in how we are given information as citizens who want to be informed and educated on how we can make an impact in Abilene for sure. The, um, it looked like they had a new... Caw Park Senior Center Coordinator, and then they have a holiday, uh, Rose Park Holiday Fundraiser for Friday, December 8th. I wish we were knew what they were fundraising for. Uh, I do know they have a lot of great facility or activities for the seniors at the park. They're, whenever they've presented their report at the Parks and Rec Division or Parks and Rec meeting, recreation meeting, board meeting, uh, I always am amazed at all the things they have to care for and, and take care of the seniors in our city. And I think that's great. And then they're going to change their board meeting to 9 a.m. And so this takes place at the Rose Park Center. So if you want to go to this one and check that one out, you'll need to go to that location starting at 9 a.m. in the future. And I think that's all we have for that particular board meeting. So moving on, we're still not even to all the good stuff here. All right. So this is the fun part. I missed this meeting and I, I emailed the uh, chairman to tell him I was sad I was going to miss because they changed the date on me and I, I, I did, wasn't able to change my plans and to ask for a list of board members because I was curious if there was actually a vacancy or if they had added a person to the board and there was really no vacancy. But in fact, two board members, actually three board members um, stepped down and they had to step up and... Um, sadly, neither one of them has come to a board meeting. In fact, the one that wasn't uh, actually appointed, none of them have, maybe one has come to, I, I'm thinking city council meeting, that one had only come to city council meetings. But I mean, you know, here we are participating and showing up and and it's just hard to know how to get this this process going. But now we have vacancies listed, so we can change it and make it better. This meeting was a total of eight minutes. They also presented a book of, I mean, I, I could start looking and maybe some of you want to really help with this. They came up with this brilliant idea that, you know, instead of having people to do reconsiderations for the books they don't think should be on the bookshelf in the children's section, that the library, the library will present a special section for city residents. You cannot do this if even if you're a county resident who pays the new $30 a year membership uh, to be a part of the public library or the membership fee or whatever. Only citizens can look at the list. And when I checked it last winter, there were over 500 books in either the juvenile section or the um, children's section. There was just too many books. And, you know, there's only so much we can do. And so it's it's really sweet that they think that was an effective way to engage with us in conversation, but it really just makes it to where there is still no conversation being had. And it's really disappointing because when they read it, they're like, there's no one making comments on any of the books. And it's like, you know, the formatting is terrible. I don't know how I'm supposed to get through 500, 500 books. I mean, you know, if I were to do 10 books a day, that would take me, you know, 50 days to go through and review and check out those books. And, and I understand that the librarians have an important job to make sure we get good books on the shelf. But because of how many books that have been questionable in the past, that have been concerning to some parents in the community and citizens in the community, we need to have a better, um, a better process to make it more streamlined and efficient for both them and us as citizens so that we can make sure we're moving in the right direction. And so no comments have been made yet going forward with this new system they have put in place. And to me, that seems like an ineffective system if not one person has engaged with it. And I believe not one person has utilized the um, juvenile or the restricted card because if you have to go and tell someone to restrict a card that you don't probably even know exists, it doesn't work as well. And anyway, there's just a lot of room for improvement. And that's one of the things I hope that these new board members who have joined in will be ready to help fix and bring solutions to the table rather than just saying we're good to go with the way it's been and moving forward with no changes because we've already run into the problems that can exist. And I think it's a good idea, especially before this downtown library moves into the Abling Heritage Squares that just broke 
ground last week. I think that is really important to make sure we only have the books that represent our community and are well um, uh, a, a good use of our taxpayer dollars on the shelves because we don't we can't have every book on a library shelf. It's just not possible. So let's make sure we're sticking in the genres that actually are beneficial to more people than some of the ones that have more controversy. And it's not about banning books. Let's not go there. And I probably got a little bit more into the editorial side, but it is something that as a person who has tried to engage and want to move forward in a, a mutual agreement with something, it has been very discouraging to not feel like you're really heard, appreciated, or valued, and that they're just going to keep doing what they've always done because they're, they're fine with the system they have in place. That's the beauty part. The beautiful part of our republic is we get to engage and have hard conversations and continue to have hard conversations until we all get to a place where we can move forward. All right. So they talked about the books they're ordering. They welcome the two new board members. One is another tie wearer. I thought, wow, did it, you know, do you have to wear a tie to be a gentleman on this particular board to match Clint, Clint's tie, Clint Buck's tie? So Joe Biles, I think is his name. He joined he joined the board and Christy Brokaw and they welcomed them. And the longest, I think he said the longest serving board member of any Abilene board stepped down and he, his name is Joe Specht and he had been serving since 1997 and had, had attended over a hundred board meetings. So that was quite impressive and we appreciate his service for sure. Um, I think that's all. Let's see here. Yep, I'm moving along too fast. I skipped a meeting. I can't believe it. Or I guess I didn't take notes on that. I, I love to be organized with my notes. Okay, so that was the library advisory meeting. Eight minutes long. I made it take as long to talk about it as it probably the meeting took. And I'm pretty sure nobody was present because when you change meetings on at the last minute like that, it really discourages people from showing up. All right, let's move to this next meeting I thought was quite interesting is, oh, I have the video, but we don't need to watch it, is the Abling, Her the Abling Housing Authority. So this, uh, I don't know if this is the board or if this is people who work there because there's really not a lot of information for me. But I thought it was a nice picture of these people. I'm sure they do some great work. And I found that they do have an agenda. Here it is. No minutes. Don't know where to find the minutes. It's like they're just not important. And I guess I just have found an area where I'm like, why? Why can't we have, if you're typing it up, just throw it there for everybody to see. It's pretty easy. And there was a lot of information on here. I don't know half of what this stuff is. is. I'm still learning about this particular board, but they approved the minutes. And so it looks like they had, let me zoom in just a little bit, some low rent public housing. They have some financial reports, human resources reports. They reviewed and adopt some regular agenda items. And they elected a vice, see, like, these are why minutes would be so helpful. They elect the election of a vice chair and executive secretary. Who were those people? Who were the people that stepped down? They had Section 8 management, a system of program, uh, payment standards, property manager stuff, uh, employee survey, CEO annual evaluation and other things like that. Um, so apparently they had a lot of stuff going on and it was certified and that's all we have for the Abling Housing Authority. I do believe there were two people just recently appointed and the only person I can remember is Travis Craver from the city council. So um, maybe he can pull some strings and get us some minutes. Um, all right. And now to the last meeting of the week. Well, yeah, it, it actually happened I think the Abling Housing Authority maybe happened at the same time. I, I can't remember now. My brain's full of lots of stuff. But there was two ag agenda items on the meeting. And, of course, the consent agenda item was almost all passed. Um, the downtown coordinator position was pulled. And I thought there was – here, I'll give you something to watch if you're watching this with me. The, the downtown position – coordinator was pulled and discussed and some questions were asked by councilman reagan on um, how this was going to look and then uh, if it was just for the downtown area what is it for and the city manager robert Hanna said you know this is really to help cut through some of the red tape of having to deal with the downtown area and what that go you know a lot of unique circumstances a lot of unique circuit oh, so the coordinator position is really to help people navigate through the unique circumstances of what it takes to get into these buildings because they're very limited. I thought it was interesting. Someone brought up grease traps and I'm like, yep, there's somebody on the, in the uh, city 
offices that really is hammering down on grease traps so in in an odd way. <laughs> like it just became something in the last year or so that grease traps are the new thing. But um, also it was mentioned by Councilman Shane Price that it, originally he thought it was going to be a community wide position. So, you know, I think I think it's hard because there's so much in our city that needs attention. And it seems like this downtown area has been the focus of this current mayor. And we just have to understand what that means and how is he working on the rest of the city. And I haven't got a lot of information to tell you on that part, but, you know, we we shall wait and see. I do know that the infill is not as great in the downtown area, so I'm not really sure what's going to happen of this, but it was a position already currently in the, um, on staff. So it was just kind of maybe a retitling of a person already on staff. I'm not sure exactly how, but it, the budget wasn't going to change much. And I, I think it's, uh, was some really good conversation because I didn't know much about it. And I was glad that Councilman Reagan pulled that so we could have some discussion. It is also to help coordinate with the Cypress Street's construction It's interesting that the downtown coordinator was pulled out to talk about when there were so many other things that were just passed through. Now, I I do want to clarify that I think there is perfectly good reason to pass certain things through the consent agenda. For example, you know, the two historical application or two historical overlay applications we've been walking through the venue, the uh, DNW venue and that Victorian house, they were approved. We've already seen that twice. We've already talked about it twice. I get it. The ACU project was also approved for that that store um that uh that location off of judge e lee right across from allen ridge what's interesting to me and i don't want to show you at all but there were different pictures in this packet and it talked about retail stores so i thought it was senior living it talked like it was senior living in the last two meetings and then this one has like dnw and it looks like it's going to be retail stores and a lot a big parking lot and so now it makes sense why the residents were upset because it wasn't just residential houses I guess the talking about using the residential zoning made it sound like it was residential houses, but it's actually just some retail, more retail for Allen Ridge, which I guess that could, that could be good for the North side. Um, ACU's doing a lot of investment with their property to bring retail stores in. And so maybe that's a good thing for us. But anyway, I just wanted to clarify this packet had different stuff in it. And I just, I think that's really interesting why we would have new information. But it was passed through historic of uh, the consent agenda. Okay, but the last thing I want to show you is this is why it pays. I don't know if it pays like in the way that I make it sound like it pays, but just learning to ask good questions, learning the language so that you can know when to ask for clarification. For example, uh, this is item number six. It is the hold a discussion res- uh, resolution to take action, approving the construction manor, manager at risk for the Cypress Street streets, <laughs> but, but I can't talk. Sorry, Cypress Street and s- s- there. That's why I can't talk. Cypress Street streetscape improvements. Okay, and so they had a special meeting for this project. I believe this was approved when we weren't currently living in Abilene, so I really don't even know how this got started. But I want to show you this is a long process. If you're talking about it for the first time or understanding it for the first time at City Council, there are so many steps it's gone through before this process. And it's so important to take notes of this has been talking about like um, for uh, like the downtown coordinator. They've been talking about it since Robert Hanna was first hired on. I didn't know that. So these are the good things you learn about, that this isn't some rash decision that they're just making overnight. This is something that has had taken a lot of process. So at this point in the game, we're kind of along for the right because apparently it's gone through all the approvals so that they can just do whatever they want to do. And so I think it's interesting to know what's going on so you can make mental notes and keep up with how things are being done for better understanding. So I'd like to zoom in if I can without losing too much of the words. So this says, oh my gosh, I'm going to play a little juggle game here. The city of Abilene advertised a required proposal for the city of Abilene Cypress Street streetscape improvements on October and October 1st and October 8th. A mandatory pre-approval meeting was held by the city council and Jacob Martin on October 17th to discuss a project and answer questions. Two proposals were received and sp- and opened on October 27th. The proposal was received and scored based upon the scoring criteria with RTF. Scoring of the proposal revealed Tenerent Construction had provided the best proposal. So they're saying they're going to award it to this particular company. And this is what I found interesting. Bond funds and TERS funds are available for this project. Okay. 
So I'm thinking, hmm, you bond funds, bond funds, I know there's general obligation bond funds, which is what we voted on for. We voted for some of those bond proposals uh, in the last election for the zoo and the recreation centers. So those those are general operation. There's certificate of obligation funds, which is what the city can take out for anything like they took out for the Abilene Youth Sports Authority infill development on the outside. They took out a bond for $1.69 million instead of saving up for it. They took out that bond because they have the right to do that. And then there's the revenue bonds, which we know come from things like the construction project for the hotel. That is given from the hotel and occupancy tax. The money from the hotel stays. There's a percentage that Texas allows them to put towards the construction to pay for the bonds of $43 million to pay for that construction since it is a private-public partnership and the public is paying for all the construction so the private can make money off of what we paid for to be built. And so this is confusing. <clears throat> and I know TERS funds, if you don't know about TERS funds, tax investment, tax invest, no, tax increment reinvestment zones. So basically, especially the downtown area is one of the TERS. There's three, but I don't know. I can't think of the first one. I, I thought the third one is maybe... ACU. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head now, and that's probably a bad thing to do. So anyway, I just realized the, the there is a board, but it only deals with TERS two and three. And I was like, why? Where's well, one? So I have to look into that. But the TERS funds are basically the taxes. There's a percentage of the taxes that the people in that area pay for. So in all of the downtown area in the soda district, they all pay for it. And then somehow, to my understanding, it gets pulled in to take care of some general projects like sidewalks and storefronts and things like that to improve the area. So it's kind of like a little, we're just going to set this aside to make it look prettier for all intents and purposes. I'm not, that's not dis disrespect. I mean, I'm not derogatory towards it. I'm just saying that's kind of what it is. And so, you know, you have to keep some of that to take care of the street maintenance and the water and the sewer and all that stuff. And so the basic needs that taxes are supposed to cover the police and fire department, you got to keep some of that money from the taxes to that. So it's a limited amount of money that they get for a certain amount of time at 20 or 30 years or something like that. And so the TERS funds come from the taxes and then um, they estimate it's going to be about $8.3 million. And so I was like, huh, bond funds. Well, which bonds? Because I thought the TERS was giving funds for this and now they're doing a bond. And so I just emailed the city manager. I said, um, do you mind explaining what bonds? And I wanted to ask what series, because I, I do know that I'm asking a legitimate question, but I, <laughs> I feel like maybe some people don't know I know what I'm what I'm trying to talk about because I haven't figured that out yet. And so he was very quick to respond. I felt very appreciative. He just said it was a certificate of obligation bond. I was like, oh, okay. So this is what I learned too that happened with the Abling the Ta Abling Taylor Venue District. It's a district, and they're getting hotel occupancy tax to pay for that, but they're going to take out a bond to have the money ready and available for the tax money comes in. And it sounds like they're doing the same thing here. I still feel like it's a little confusing and I don't know why they couldn't put information about that in a better way. They may not have to. I find that they, they seem to do things pretty on the up and up. And so sometimes my wanting to know doesn't mean I'm entitled to know it, <laughs> but it would be helpful, you know, to say that they're by the bonds. I think it would have been better if it said bond funds from pr provided by or paid by or reimbursed or, to be paid by the TERS funds are available, but it sounds like there's bond funds and there's TERS funds, but they're not. And so is that what he was really saying? Or are there really just bond funds that are coming from the TERS funds? So I'll look into that and see if I can find anything more about it because I'm learning and growing and that makes me excited. And it is a lot of money to be spending on one street in an entire area because there's lots of other streets around it. And so what's going to happen to the other streets around it? It's it's a lot. And because I'm still learning about it because I wasn't here when it happened, I wasn't here when the downtown hotel project was started officially. I know it's been in the works for 30 years, but I, I just don't know enough information. And so I'm kind of giving you an opportunity to learn with me. So I thought that was interesting. There you go. All right. So one of the only one of the only wait, one of the two only regular agenda items was this uh, fallen hero uh, park or little area that's dedicated to all the city employees who have who have lost their lives in the line of duty. And so they have set aside $419,000 of the minor improvement project fund 
minor improvement fund, minor project fund. There's lots of names I've learned from the years. And so what this fund is, you know, most things have a specific area where they have to go to. You have to spend this money here and this money here. You can't just do it on everything. And so when people are like, you know, don't do this, we should fix our streets. Well, they do have some limitations on where they can spend money on the streets and they have other limitations for other things. And so We have to learn those limitations so we can wield and utilize our resources more effectively. And this is the Minor Improvement Project Fund is something they get to just kind of put a wish list together. And as the funds are there, they can chalk off things that they want. And this is one of the things they had on for the 2024 year, fiscal year, FY year, fiscal year. And so they had a local construction, Tim McClarity, I think is his name, and he worked really hard to get it done. It's going to take about 180 days. It's going to have etched drawings on these plaques for the people. There were 15 employees that have lost their lives. Most of them are police officers. And it was a really, a really sobering moment as the families who were there expressed how it made them feel. It was really beautiful. And I think this is going to be a a healing thing for for those. And it's just a way to honor those who have have worked and given their lives in the line of duty. And one of, in fact, one of them was a parks and rec gentleman who uh, lost his life when he was, uh, there was some tree trimming accident or something like that. And, And his son got up and talked about what a great leader he was and how he put himself as a leader in places that were more difficult so that his team wouldn't have to. And He just talked about how it inspired him to be who he is today. And I just think that's beautiful. And so this will look great. It's going to happen at the, um, right outside the Civic Center. I guess it's called the Convention Center now. I'm old school and still call it the Civic Center. The Convention Center where there's a, a, a plaza that is not used very much. And so they're going to put some shades up there and hopefully people will walk through it and, and just see some of the people who've left their impact, uh, left their their legacy here in Abilene. All right. Now, this is the thing that I am I have been following along because again, this was something that happened I was not in Abilene for about 3 a little over 3 years, closer to 4 years. And <laughs> there's a lot that happens in that amount of time and I'm still just learning what's going on. And so here is the next phase. The last thing I'm going to talk to you about is the last phase uh, or maybe the next phase is a better word for the Abilene Youth Sports Authority. So there was some American Rescue Plan funds that were available for COVID and one of those funds uses can be for tourism. And so they're they're using the ARPA funds. There was 10 million given and 5 million of that is going to this project. They're using that to help contribute to the um, rock center, which is behind it and all the fields that go with it. So I've looked and tried to do a lot of research on this and there's really not much. And so I wanted to show you, this is how sometimes things go. You see something on the agenda and you're like, oh, I want to learn about it. And then you come to the page and look, it says, information will be provided at the meeting. I've never seen that happen before. I've been paying attention to meeting packets for probably about a year now, and I've never seen anything told me like nothing. There's nothing. That's the end of the packet. And so I was like, well, we're going to go to find out. And so uh, City Manager Robert Hanna presented the information, and I look forward to getting some of those details uh, in some of the handouts I know they have available, but they just didn't uh, disclose much in the presentation and the, the slides or anything like there was one slide that said they were just re, uh, let's see what it says, economic development agreement and lease agreement with the Abilene Youth Sports Authority. And so uh, this is the first I've heard any numbers. And I and again, I don't know if I haven't looked in the right places, but I've seen no information. All I knew is we we're giving $5 million for the fields behind it. And I believe the Abilene Youth Sports Authority has done a great job of really innovatively creating a a great niche in the city. And because of the private private public partnership with the city, I think there's been some great um, benefits uh, that have come out of it. And so I think if I remember correctly, the 12 acres was given to the Abilene Youth Sports Authority to build on and they funded the 9 million, although I heard on Thursday, it was $10 million to build the facility. The city uh, took out a bond for 1.69 million to do like the parking lot and the outside stuff, the infill And then they really felt like this was the next wave because in 2018, there wasn't a citizen that wanted to really pay for a rec center with a bond. And we barely squeaked that out. So I'm not sure that was really what everybody wanted, but they technically got that $28 million to work on the rec centers. 
And so this is an attempt to get more people to come to Abilene, use hotels, eat at restaurants and stuff like that. And so the original amount I've always seen was $5 million, But on Thursday, Robert Hanna let us know that it is now going to be a contribution of $10 million. And so I thought that was really interesting because, you know, that's that's a quite a big jump because it's one thing to be contributing from some money given from COVID to now it's coming out of the budget. And when the mayor was on his campaign last spring, he said, there's no money in the budget for extra stuff. We've got to give up something. And so now we've just passed, uh, let's see, I don't know, 28 and 15. So that's almost $45 million in a bond election for new things in our city. And now we're expanding this $5 million project into a $10 million project. It just feels like we're rolling in the dough and we've got all this money to spend in. And I'm not sure how that's going to work out for us, but, you know, as it stands, this is the path forward they're going and they have full permission to do it. There's there's nothing they're doing that's wrong. I just think it's interesting how much money has just been going out, going out, going out for things right now. Um, so $5 million. I wanted to look at, I wrote it down because there was nothing given to us. So the Abilene Youth Sports Authority has come up. They've had to increase because of inflation. So that's where the extra $5 million is coming. We're having to pay for the city is having to pay the extra $5 million because of inflation. So originally it was supposed to be $10 million from AYSA and $5 million from the city's ARPA funds. Now it's $31 million total. So the AYSA is coming up with $21 million and the city is coming up with $10 million from the minor improvement project. And it was already denoted in the budget meeting that happened in July. And then I don't think it was talked about very much at the August one, but they're putting the $5 million towards these flat fields, which we soccer fields, football fields, lots of different options, lacrosse. And there was one other option I can't remember, but so the difference of the 5 million was going to come out of for five years, we're going to pay off the 4 million at 800 K a year. And I can't remember where that's coming from. I didn't write that down, but there's $800,000 in our budget. If it's not the minor improvement fund, I don't know where it would be coming from. And then they were actually able to find uh, almost a million dollars, 996000 to be paid through the utility fund um, because it's like has to do with relocating water lines and sewers. And because of the agreement the city has with the Abilene Youth Sports Authority, if for some reason the Abilene Youth Sports Authority is no longer using that facilities, should it fail to continue to exist, it reverts back to the city. So I guess that's kind of the risk reward management that you have there. Um, and I think that's it. But they're leasing the facility. So there is a little bit of um, anything to all the people that have been working throughout the years to get this done. And again, you know, there's different conversations we have to have about it. You know, I love for my kids to enjoy stuff. I want them to have stuff. I enjoy it. But then it comes down to spending money on stuff. I have to think about it differently. I just don't go and buy stuff. And and that's not the exact, it's not a good translation or a good example, except that we have to look at what our numbers are and we have to see how we're doing as a city. And when we have as much, I mean, we're that the, we just agreed to increase our taxes. We're in, you know, and in a time of inflation, and it's it's just a little unnerving to wonder how it's all going to work out. And, you know, Lord willing, as long as the creeks don't rise, they're going to be able to make the payments on these bonds and the taxes are going to come in and, and everything's going to go well. And, you know, fingers crossed that that's the way it's going to go. But we just have to begin sobering up to realize if we were already in the spring in a place where there was no extra money and $5 million was just pulled out of our budget. That's concerning to me as a citizen, not because it's wrong, but because I don't know enough information. So I'm going to encourage you and me both to continue to look and see what's going on with this, because when you have no notes in the meeting packet, it makes me a little suspect. And when you don't have anything to research or study, it does make people wonder what's not being said. And I don't know if that's the case, but when when you're not given the information, you just have a little bit of a a struggle to wonder what you're not getting and it may be nothing. And that's what we're going to look into. So I thought it was a very interesting, like I, I really wanted to say up and go, I mean, I laughed out loud. I'm sure they were like, Oh my gosh, Tammy, you know, don't talk, <laughs> don't make noises. I mean, nothing was said. It was just like, you know, I felt like it was just the motions. And before it was even over, I didn't even know what to say. If I'd known 
if I'd had the presented the information presented longer than two minutes before I had a chance to speak, I would have said, what are we thinking here? We just spent $45 million and now we're going to spend another $5 million and they haven't spent the $45 million that's coming out in bonds and you know, they'll come out with that next year or whenever they start that project. But it's just, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. And I'm thankful that we have been a part of this process to start to learn how to ask good questions and have good conversations. And again, we want to be informed and educated. And if that's, if that's where we're at and that's what we, we, we are, those kind of people, then we're winning and we're doing a lot better than we were before. And so hard questions are not directed at people because we believe they're doing nefarious things. It's just we need to know them for more information. And I feel like a lot of things are lacking in the full picture. And I'm not sure why. So it, it is very, very much the norm in a lot of areas. And I would like to be a part of helping bring to light the information we need to know in order to make informed decisions and be educated to be able to make an impact in Abilene in the big country. So thanks for sticking with me on that long week in review. It was a lot of meetings and there was a lot of takeaways. And so I hope I didn't take you too much through that. But I do think it's important for us to understand what's going on. All right. So next we have the week in preview or that's my husband likes it. He didn't like my week at a glance. And I was like, but that's what I've always done. And he's like, well, it makes more sense. If you're reviewing the week, then you need to preview it. So here it is the week in preview. It's not a lot. It's Thanksgiving. I'm excited to get to have family and celebrate the holiday. So there's not a lot here. I, I will show you really quickly the calendar that's coming. It didn't, it's there's, there's three meetings and I should have had this open for you. I'm sorry. It's it's the week before the holidays. So on Monday, this is a, if you want to hear some interesting things going on in our community, show up to this one. This is the Abling Taylor C County Events Venue Board District, our district board. It's on November 20th, Monday, 1.30 to 3.30. And they have their agenda posted out already. And then the November 21st, which is Tuesday, there's the Park and Recreation Board. I think that's also a great meeting to attend. There's a lot of helpful information. It's also recorded if you're not available to attend. And then unfortunately, Landmarks Commission was canceled. I'm not sure if they didn't have anything to talk about or maybe they can have a quorum because it is the holiday week. Since the city is closed for Thanksgiving and most of us will be eating turkey at some point this week, I thought a great way would be to just remember. I wanted to share with you from the wall builders. There's just some pictures, but it was some things I've learned from them about. Um, he has the David Barton has the largest uh, original source documents of any collection in the world. And he has got some, ama it's amazing. He'll say, look, here's the original document. Here's the original document. And I know that you could look him up and he can talk to you about the first Thanksgiving. But I do think we need to go back and revisit what the original Thanksgiving was about and why it happened, not because of the commercialized version we have now or even the revised or uh, the one that's been, re yeah, the revised version of it because we have to know our roots and we have to know our history. And so I thought it was really interesting. Did you know? I didn't know this. But the first day of Thanksgiving actually happened in Palo, uh, Palo Dura Canyon in Texas in 1541. And I believe there were six other Thanksgiving Day celebrations, like Days of Thanksgiving, prior to the pilgrims arriving in our in our country. They, of course, the pilgrims arrived at Plymouth. They came on the Mayflower, and half of the people on the boat died. The winter was terrible because of all the delays um, and some underhanded stuff. It's a fascinating history, the American Covenant. Uh, no, not the American Covenant. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that's what happened when I pop off little things. The American Story by uh, the Bartons. It's a great book that gives you a lot of great information. But also the American Covenant is a great book by um, Forrester, Marshall Forrester. Uh, the pilgrims arrived at Pilgrim. Half of them died. They had a chance to go back, but they decided to stay. They ran into Samoset, a, a Native American who was greeted. They greet, He greeted him in English. And that is so amazing. This, this young man had unfortunately been sold into slavery or had been captured and taken to England, learned English and somehow escaped back to the land. And he walked up and looky here, right after he discovered his own tribe had been killed to disease or something, he found these other people who could speak a language he understood. And he was able to help them and, and, and introduce him to Squanto. And they were accepting of the Christian faith. They believed in, in Jesus and it gave them peace with the Wampanoag Indians and it was just neat how it all worked together. It wasn't like this um, aggressive thing at all. It was just a, a neat coming together of people who were trying to sustain life. And 
because of all their help with the pilgrims, they had a bountiful harvest and they wanted to celebrate that, acknowledge that. So in December of 1621, they had a three-day feast to thank God, not just, sorry, they had a three-day feast to thank God, not just celebrations, but they had prayer, food, worship, and it really spread throughout the new, new Northeast colonies. Um, but I guess it really didn't start spreading until the revolution. And then once the American Revolution happened in 1789, because Congress takes notes of what they do, they have it in the, the 19, uh, 1789 Journal of Congress, where they decided to um, issue a, a separate, po- they issued s- separate proclamations and adopted a- and adopted it right after the Constitution was adopted because they wanted to um, not let a season pass uh, for all cultures to give. Sorry, let me try this again because I'm getting very distracted by here. There's, okay, so it, it was passed in 1789 because they did not want to let a season pass for all the citizens to give. Uh, thanks for so many blessings from God. Okay. And so they ask Washington to do this proclamation. And so, of course, I was watching a video with David Barton holding the actual proclamation, the original proclamation from Washington, George Washington. And he said, duty of all nations to acknowledge providence of almighty God to do his will, to be grateful for his benefits and to humbly implore his protection and favor. And so that's what it started it continued as, and then, of course, there was a lady named Sarah Hale, who was a mother of five, and she had a woman's magazine, and for thir- three decades, she petitioned presidents and leaders to officially declare Thanksgiving to be a national holiday, and so in 1863, Lincoln finally had a proclamation for it, and then in 1941, it was made permanent, and so it's interesting I have always been a traveler of Thanksgiving, so we always go and we never get to really prepare. And so this is one of the first years we're actually having family come and it's going to be fun making goodies and just getting to spend some time being grateful for all that God has done in this past year and remembering that it is the relationships we have in our life that actually give us the the depth of joy that we long for as people. And it's nice just to take a break. And then I'm sure some people will want to enjoy going on to the next step and shopping, right? (laughs) I'm not a shopper, so it doesn't affect me much. But I do love getting to be around people. I'm a quality time person. And so I hope you get to have some time. And if you don't have a place to celebrate Thanksgiving, and you are in Abilene, reach out to me, because most of you know me somehow, and you will have a place to join us at the table, because there's always room for more. And I am so grateful for all that God is doing in our city. And I hope you get to enjoy. There will be a new episode, a new type of episode dropping, hopefully in the next week or so called Book by the Bite, where you get to listen to me talk about a book that I've read. And I think it's something we should all read. And it'll be a different book. Uh, It'll be a different an episode because it will be more editorial where I share more stuff about what's going on in the culture wars. And so if you want to check that out, and if not, it's okay. I really do want to have some different options because we can be factual and informational, but there is a time where we have to actually hold, take a position and, and protect the values that we hold dear in our nation. And uh, as we, you get to learn to trust me and learn that I, I do try to come at it from a very, uh, a place of wisdom and truth, then you'll see that we can we can have uh, discussions about what really matters to us and and how we can make a greater impact in Abilene in the big country. So don't forget to subscribe and share this podcast with your friends and family, maybe in next door. Let's focus on that and check the calendar. I don't know if I've mentioned that in a while. Just look at the calendar on Friday or Saturday and see what's going on for the week to come to see where you can plug in. Because remember, you're looking for one board that you can stick with, follow, and or show up and get involved and help be a place of engagement within the community. And so um, from our family to yours, I hope you have a great Thanksgiving and thank you for listening. And I look forward to talking to you after the holidays. (music)